Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prosperity Through Multifamily Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Cody Laughlin, and joining me today is my buddy over there, Mr. Brian Alfaro. Brian, how we doing, man? Cody, I'm living the dream, and I'm super excited about today's guest. Yeah, man, me too. Fired up. Been a big, big follower of today's guest, so super honored to have him on the show. So tell us who that is. All right. Today in the house, we have Mr. Dan Hanford. If you don't know who Dan is, you're probably living under a rock. Uh, Dan and his wife, Danae, along with their four children and Standard Poodle, reside and work in Columbia, South Carolina. Dan is one of the managing partners with PassiveInvesting.com, which is a national passive apartment investing firm based in the Carolinas. He has led his apartment syndication company to acquire over 2,600 units with a portfolio valued over $357 million. It's awesome. He is also a passive apartment investor himself in 5,700 plus units in 28 different syndication investments located across the Southeast USA and Texas. Prior to getting started investing in real estate, Dan had an extensive background in starting multiple seven-figure businesses from scratch, including a large group of non-surgical orthopedic medical clinics located in South Carolina. Dan is also the founder of the Multifamily Investor Nation, which is hashtag F. MFIN, which I am a part of, which is awesome, where he provides free multifamily education to a nationwide group of over 31,000 members. The MFIN has 50 plus meetup groups across the US, Canada, and UK that meet on the first Monday of every month. And if you haven't heard, he also hosts one of the most popular apartment investing podcasts on iTunes called Multifamily Investor Nation, where he only interviews active multifamily investors that have closed the deal in the last 12 months. There's no fluff on this multifamily podcast. He only gets down to the nuts and bolts of deal sourcing, financing, structuring, investor relations, closing, due diligence, and more. Mr. Dan Hanford, welcome to the show. Well, Brian and Cody, I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, thank you for that, uh, that introduction. And just one thing to, to kind of tag in there is that just two little updates that I, when you were reading it, I was like, I, those, there's two things I need to update is that I, I, my wife and I are now invested in over 7,000 units passively with 32 different uh, uh, passive syndications with uh, 11 different operators now. And uh, we're now the number one podcast on iTunes, the Multifamily Investor Nation. So if you go to your, your uh, iPhone or iPad or other device and you type in iTunes, Multifamily, we are number one. We've been that way for the majority of 2020. So we're really excited about that. We have a lot of people like yourself that follow us on, on the podcast, but also on other areas. And I uh, would love to have you know anybody on here to kind of follow us there and uh, looking forward to today and, and diving into uh, the topics at hand. Yeah, man. Like we said, honored to have you on the show, Dan, and, and been a big follower of your for some time now and actually got uh, familiar with you and your business through your podcast. And uh, it's a phenomenal show. Definitely encourage uh, those who are just w whatever experience level to, to definitely tune in. And I, I know I've picked up a tremendous amount of information uh, from the active investors you've had on your show. So really appreciate the value that you're adding to the community. And and as Brian said, it, it's kind of hard to imagine those who, if there's anybody out there that may not know you and your story, but tell us a little bit more about you and your background and, and how you found yourself in the commercial real estate space. Sure. Well, I don't know how much detail you want me to get into, but um, so I... I mainly got into it from the tax for, to be able to take advantage of the tax side of things. Right. So I had started a business and in, in school and when I was in school, started that business, which was very profitable and allowed me to start my next business and allow me to grow the orthopedic side of things, the orthopedic business that I own now, my wife and I still own all those businesses still hundred percent and they're all debt free. But the cash flow that we were generating off of that was causing us to have to, uh, pay a lot of money to the government in taxes. And so we did some research and found that investing inside of real estate was a great vehicle to be able to reduce our taxable liability. And that's really where our passiveinvesting.com group was, spart was spawned from, was from uh, the, the, the reasons for our own purposes of being able to reduce our taxable liability. And now we're able to help a lot of other investors around the country. We're almost at a thousand investors actively in our syndications. And, and even with 2020 being a, a, a not so good year for a lot of people, uh, we were still able to raise about $61 million, just over $61 million in equity from our investors and, uh, and, and acquiring about $156 million in assets in, in 2020. So looking forward to continuing to expand that in 2021 and uh, looking to do a, have a target of you know just over $300 million next year in acquisitions. So you, so you had a slow year to say. 
<laughs> we did actually. I mean, our goal this year was supposed to be at 300 million. And, you know, we had a few deals that earlier in the year that because of COVID, they, they fell out and it really wasn't our fault from it. It was more from the seller side because yield maintenance and the treasury going down, the yield maintenance went up and caused the deals to kind of fall through. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I tell you, man, that's still an impressive amount of volume that you've been able to acquire and, and, and uh, manage, especially raising an equity and such throughout this year. And I think in general, most people that we've had conversations with, you know, really haven't transacted at all, um, our, ourselves included and, and for various reasons, but, uh, you know, it's always good to hear that, you know, you, you've definitely still continue to have some momentum and, and 2020 is looking up for you. But, um, you know, I kind of wanted to go back and allude to your career as a medical professional uh, real quick. And, and uh, my background is in the medical profession as well as a registered nurse. I've been doing that for, I don't know, 12 years now or so. But um, I find that, you know, now over my experience over the past several years is that physicians are looking more and more for opportunities like this, whether it be from a tax advantage or, you know, a diversification of their portfolio. Um you know, in, in preserving their wealth, right? And I think what we're seeing in, in the healthcare industry now, and maybe you could speak to this a little bit more in just a brief detail is, you know, I find that doctors are working harder and harder and getting paid less and less with the way that insurance practices have changed over the past couple of years. And, you know, they're just looking for an alternative, you know, some way to kind of, again, continue to preserve their wealth, if you will. So um, any, you know, are you still active in the medical profession yourself, correct? I am not. So I don't go into the clinics anymore. I haven't actually stepped foot in any of our clinics in about three years. So I have a good corporate management team that manages everything on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I have a corporate meeting with my team once a month for about an hour, just to look over the statistics and the, the, the statistics and the KPIs and make sure that the vision of the clinic is still moving forward. But I no longer go into the clinics. Gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. Yeah. So you're more from the operational standpoint, but yeah. Correct. Excellent. So um, well, I, I definitely hope that, you know, if there's any listeners out there today that it may be a medical professional themselves that are kind of hearing your story, getting familiar with your story, uh, can, that will definitely resonate with them as, you know, why real estate offers such a powerful advantage, um, you know, again, to preserving your wealth and building, yeah long-term wealth for their families and, and generations to come. But, um, well, and, and, and a little thing to add to that too, is, you know, one of the reasons why apartment syndication has done so well is because there are physicians out there that still like doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And they really have a passion to be able to help people. I think majority of them have that kind of passion. And so, yes, they're, they're working harder and they're, you know, they're, they're obviously earning money, but they, because they're working harder, they're also not having the time to be able to invest in, in, in alternative of assets like real estate and self storage and you know th those types of, of hard assets and so they have this kind of FOMO right this fear of missing out of being able to get those those higher returns and that's really why apartment syndication is there to begin with is that it allows people like that that either they don't necessarily hate what they do but they want to make sure that they're still growing their nest egg as they're continuing to work hard and and serving other people and so that's one of the main reasons why we we started our passive investing.com group was to be able to help people just like that and it's not just in, in in the medical field you know we see people that are you know engineers and they're in the it space or whatever and they're business owners and they really jo enjoy and have a passion for what they're doing but they want to have this avenue of being able to kind of grow their wealth um, and, and and eventually maybe they want to get to the point where their kind of passive income surpasses their active income or whatever um, but you know that's one of the things that i think as an active investor that you have to always think about is in a lot of times these these investors they don't want to quit what they're doing they they, they they want to continue to serve and continue to to do what they were called to do but they still want to have that opportunity and that value that we can provide as active syndicators to provide to them yeah that, that's a very good point and, and that's one of the things that i love about you know this industry in particular is you can offer that value and offer that opportunity to those uh individuals who are looking to do just what you mentioned. So, um, and, and kind of segueing from that, I want to go back to your start of passiveinvesting.com and your business. You know, you know, you were looking at this from a tax advantage standpoint. You know, how do you, you know, kind of go into some tax sheltering? But kind of talk to me a little bit about how you started to define your investing thesis. Kind of what was the, you know, asset types that you were you really going after? How did you know that syndication was kind of the route that you wanted to go? And and Talk to us about that. 
Sure. Well, when I first started getting into the space, you know, I was looking at smaller units. I was looking at a, I remember looking at a, tw- a 12 unit. Uh, there was a 22 unit property that we were looking at. I even looked at like an eight unit property as well. And then, you know, I already knew that I already built, you know, a, a business that had done really, really well. And I didn't really want to start small again. Right. I wanted to be able to kind of go out of the gate and start to start to you know, acquire larger properties. And so what I started to do first is I started to actively invest in other operators first. And then after I got, got a few deals under my belt that way, I actually hired a mentor and that mentor allowed me to build a partner with him, with them. And then I had another group that I partnered with. And that was that and the main reason for that initial kind of co GP, if you will, and partnership was to build my own level of credibility, you know, for not just for the brokers, but also for the sellers. So I could actually have that kind of extra credence to be able to sh- tell them that, yes, we can actually perform on what we're saying we're going to perform. And then our very first property that our group bought on our own with no other uh, uh, co GP that we were the main operator on was an $8.9 million property. And we raised about a little over two and a half million dollars to be able to acquire that property. And I will say that was probably our hardest raise we've ever done because it was the very first deal and we had never done it before. Um, But, you know, fast forward to today, you know, last month we closed a large $57.6 million deal and raised $21.49 million to acquire it. And so we are, have, have, have gone down this process of being able to grow it. But one, the biggest thing in the beginning, in the beginning is trying to find that mentor that you could work with that can help reduce your learning curve to kind of get you to the point of where you are today. And in the beginning, kind of our initial investment thesis was to go after kind of the, 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 the lower end C class and lower end B class assets. And we have now shifted away from that. And we are now only buying B plus assets with value add inside of a nice A class area and also A class, um, A class assets as well. And when I say A class, I'm not saying we're going to go after the kind of downtown urban, Ill, urban infill type of class A where the rents could be, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month or more. I'm, or more going after the suburban class A's where they're not going to be that far off from the class B plus uh, rents where they're going to be anywhere between about thirteen hundred to about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars a month in rent. So that's kind of our, 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 our thesis has kind of changed and morphed from the, the lower end assets to the higher end assets. And then as far as market selection, we don't go after any lower, lower end secondary or tertiary markets because we're bringing, we're bringing, we're using other people's money. We want to make sure that we have that additional protection by investing in a solid market that is actually surrounded and stabilized by blue chip corporations so that it has some de- some job stability inside of that market. And so we're going to go after, you know, it might be a, a higher end secondary, meaning like a Charlotte, North Carolina, because Charlotte, even though you might think of it as being a primary, I kind of think of it as primary, but lenders actually think of it as actually a secondary market. Now I'd say considered a higher end secondary, but still that's, those are the kind of marks we want to go after. Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, that whole triangle area, Greenville, South Carolina, Charleston, Atlanta, Tampa, Jacksonville. We're also now kind of moved a little bit more to the West and started to go into the Dallas, Fort Worth and the Phoenix, Arizona area as well. Um, But that's kind of how we have shifted over the years of when we first got started to where we are today. Yeah, I appreciate you explaining that. And and, uh, I kind of wanted to go back and and one was going to ask you if you'd be willing to kind of elaborate a little bit more on why the shift in the thesis, you know, because I feel like as now in, in a lot of the mentorship programs or, or, you know, the different real estate conferences you go to, you know, you always hear about the value add, you know, the BNC space and, and whatnot. And, and what happens or, or in my observation, it seems to be very oversaturated with new investors coming into the space because it sounds so attractive, but you know, what we've been observing, especially I think over the past, probably 18, 24 months is kind of what you mentioned, this more flight to quality and, and a better, uh, risk adjusted basis. When you talk about the flight to quality, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of, you know, your thesis going down to that quality asset? Sure. So there's a, there's a couple of reasons be behind it. You know, the first reason would be that if you look at the current state of the market, you know, forget COVID right now for a minute, even pre COVID, the differentiation, the differentiation between a a C class cap rate going in cap rate and a B class or an A class there's not that much of a delta between the two of them between all three of them. Right. You know, we looked at it and there's maybe 30, 40, 50 basis spread between all three of those. And so for us, we made the decision that if we can buy a 
nice A class asset for you know a four and a half cap, but right now we can buy a C class for a five cap. I'd rather buy the nicer asset, right? Um, and so it's going to get, cause me to have, it's going to allow me to have more consistent cash flows. It's going to allow me to have uh, not, maybe not as high of cash flows, right? Because it's a, it's a class A asset, but I'm going to have. Uh, a lot less deferred maintenance, a lot, a lot less of the unknowns of things that happen on older properties, right? And it's also a lot less headache, right? Um, for, for us as the operator, we have a lot less headaches on those particular properties. So that's one of the reasons why. And then the second reason that I would say is that we found the same thing that you're, you, you said, where there's a lot of, of competition in those, lower, in, those, uh, in those lower types assets. And so we actually are now in a, in a market where uh, we have to still have a lot of competition, but now we're not kind of competing with syndicators, right? And other apartment syndicators. We're actually competing with uh, institutional partners, right? We're, we're buying these properties from family offices, REITs, hedge funds, billionaires, those types of institutional equity um, partners that are, we're buying these assets from. And so our, we usually only look at about a $20 million on the low end, upwards to 75 to a hundred million dollar uh, property to be able to acquire it. And so that's one of the things that you're not really going to see because when people are first getting started, it's harder for them to buy that $20 million plus property. And most people in the syndication space are going to stay below 20 million. And most of them are going to probably stay below 10 million. Right. And so when you're when you stay below that $10 million mark, especially right now in the state of the market, guess what that does? It actually pushes you now into those lower end secondary and tertiary markets, which is what you're seeing. You see a lot of people putting out deals right now that are in these kind of lower end secondary and tertiary markets. And me and my wife, as we place our own passive capital, we don't want to invest in those types of markets. We want to make sure we're investing in these solid markets. And so we look for that as well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny to hear you speak because that's a it's verbatim. I mean, it's exactly what we're seeing in the marketplace as we're staying active sourcing opportunities. You know, uh, we're, we're over here in Texas and uh, we're in various markets, but I mean, that's the exact circumstance we find ourselves in. And, um, and it is, a, it's a challenge and um, it, it's kind of, it feels like a sticky spot in this market cycle we're in, right? It, it just, there, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of question marks and we can kind of talk about that at the later time. But, you know, like you said, you know, when the, the cap rate spread is, marginal if any at all between the different asset types it just makes it very uncomfortable when you're looking at some of these older products or you know whatnot and trying to trying to figure out what the right strategy is and so um well, one, and, and one, I, other, one other tidbit Cody that i would cody that i would tell you about uh when it comes to market selection and one of the other reasons why we stay inside of the primary markets and the higher and secondaries is that they do have lower cap rates, right? Because a lot of times in these coaching programs, they'll tell you, oh, don't buy an asset unless it's like, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10% cap rate, right? And to me, I, I kind of bought into that in the beginning. And then I started doing my own research and I was like, wait a minute, this makes no sense to me. Like I, I would rather buy an asset even though there's more competition that's driving the cap rate down, I would rather buy an asset in a higher quality market because if I put the same kind of time and energy and effort into that property as if I would do, if it was an 8% cap rate uh, type of a market, I actually have a better return on my time and my investment by investing in that property because if in a in a 5% cap rate market, I increase the value of that property by $100,000. I've increased the value of that property by $2 million. But if I'm in an 8% cap rate market, I've only increased the value of that property by 1.25 million. So for us, we like to have that. We almost call it like our litmus test, right? If the cap rate's too high, guess what? There's not enough competition in that market for us to sell the deal on the other end. And so if the cap rate is being driven down, that means there's a lot of competition. And that means I'm, I'm actually, I have a safer bet of being able to sell it on the back end at the same time. Yeah, I, I appreciate you alluding to that because that, that's at a risk adjusted basis that we talk about, right? When you're looking at these deals. And, and I would argue, you know, every investor appetite's a little bit different, but I would feel like personally, the general sentiment right now in the marketplace is I would feel like most investors, especially as limited partners are probably okay with that lower return in a, in a more stabilized primary market, be, you know, because of that, you know, they would rather place their capital in somewhere where they know it's going to be a performing market for years to come. It's not going to feel very much impact, no matter what we coming out of this COVID pandemic or not, whatever's coming in the future uh, versus like you said, going into some of these secondary tertiary markets where, you know, you don't have, you don't have that to fall back on. 
Yeah. And, and it's not really that much of a Delta in the return levels. It is definitely lower, especially the, the cash flows during the hold period. Cause if you're going to buy a class A asset, right. And you're going to buy that asset and you're going to hold on to it for usually seven years instead of your typical five, because there's no forced depreciation, you're going to have to hold on to it for a few more years longer, but the cash flows will be a little bit lighter, but guess what? You still get a nice bump on the back end because that cap rate is now driven, driven down. And so you have this kind of balance coming back and forth from the cash flow flows versus the, the back end uh, promote, not promote, but the back end profits from the LP perspective. And so when you look at the actual spectrum of where A class returns end up versus the current C class returns, you're probably looking about mid to mid to high teens as far as those C class assets, probably right in the middle of the road for the B class. And then the, the A class is going to be kind of a, a low teens, right? You're going to start seeing like, you know, like 12, 13, 14% right now, depending on the asset and kind of where it's located in the return metrics and in the business plan and things like like that. But to me, especially with the current state of the market, I'm willing to give up a few basis, you know, 100, 200, 300 basis points to being a, a, a more risk averse type of uh, a risk adjusted type of an investment. Yeah, I, I think we completely agree with you. And, and, and that's why, you know, we're a big fan of what you're doing in your business is because I think we we've had this paradigm shift ourselves again over the past 18 months or so that we've been in the business is in seeing exactly what you just alluded to is that flight to quality and, and that risk adjusted, um, you know, basis or whatever, if you will, it just, you know, it, it feels like a better spot to be in uh, for sure. But I kind of want to, you know, in, in pivoting to that, you mentioned the various asset types and return metrics you can expect. You know, there's been a lot of conversation this year about COVID and how the different asset types perform during different economic downturns and blah, blah, blah. You know, with your portfolio being primarily, you know, B plus, you know, a assets. What have you seen as far as an impact with uh, COVID this year in your operations or your business? What's COVID? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Love that response, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so r really what I would say is that the, the lower end the assets that we have actually did not perform as well as the higher end assets. And it's, it's kind of counterintuitive what, what a lot of people might think because we've never seen this before in our lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is something that is new to everybody, but the higher end assets, and this is actually across the board, if you look at the stats and the data, across the board, the higher end assets performed much better during this last COVID recession than the lower end assets. The lower end assets are the ones that got hurt the worst, right? And so the people that, you know, didn't plan for that rainy day, you know, those are the ones, those are the properties that are going to be, you know, you're going to probably see in 2021, they're going to be going to market and going to be, need to be offloaded because, you know, they're trying to avoid, you know, losing their shirt, if you will. But same thing happened in our portfolio. I mean, right now we're, we're back to probably of pre-COVID numbers, if you will, where we're only off by probably about maybe one to two percentage points when it comes to collections. But, you know, even now a lot of our properties are, are back to the pre-COVID status and there's not really any change in that collection number for the properties. Yeah, that's got to be a pretty good feeling, I'd imagine. And I know like some of the, you know, graphs and data that we've looked at earlier in the year is kind of what you mentioned, right, is the upper tier class assets probably saw an initial impact more immediate, but then also saw a very faster, much quicker recovery. And they've been able to sustain versus the lower tier class, like you mentioned. Um, it's going to take them so much longer to recover from this insult, uh, you know, than those upper tier. So uh, I, I bet you that's got to be a good feeling to know that, you know, you're, you're in a great position now. Um, oh, it's definitely a good feeling now. But <laughs> I mean, when this all, all this stuff started to happen, I mean, we're you know, we kind of, I call it kind of call it a butt pucker moment. Like you never really know what's going to happen. You know, you're kind of freaking out inside, but you're trying to keep calm, keep cool and uh, just make the best decisions for your investors and also over communicating with them. And that's what we did. And during COVID is we knew this was happening. And so we normally do our a monthly update email to our investors to maintain a communication level with our investors. And we send that email and we update them on how the prior month performed. Well, we made the decision in, in March that during April and May, well, we were going to be giving them a weekly update on the collection numbers because that was the big question mark, right? You know, and then it, of course in, in in April, collection numbers came in pretty strong, and everybody's like, "Well, just wait till May." And then May numbers came in. It was like, "Well, you till June, it's going to hit, it's going to hit." And thankfully, we never had a major hit, but we constantly updated our investors so that we were proactive about it, and they'd have to like reach out to us and say, "Hey, how's the property performing this week?" We main we maintain that extra level of communication to them to make sure that they were comfortable with 
you know, where we were. And then at the same time, we were also raising for a $51.5 million, not 51 and a half, it was a $49.955 million deal. We signed that deal up in the beginning of March. And then of course, you know what happened later in March, the bottom fell out of the market and we're sitting there raising $19.4 million to acquire that. We only had 60 days to do it. And we literally took the entire 59 days to raise that money and we closed on the 60th day. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, that's awesome, Dan. I think that's a great segue into uh, the topic of investor relations. You know, you have such a tremendous portfolio and you've, you've grown tremendously over the last few years. And, you know, you mentioned being able to raise all that equity during COVID. Uh, think just a little bit about your, your systems that you have in place for investor relations. And, you know, you just mentioned a little bit about communication and, you know, your strategies behind your email campaigns, you know, just keeping people updated. But, uh, a lot of investors we've talked to during COVID said they spent a lot of their time because they were at home, you know, working on their systems, putting things in place to scale in the future. Uh, what have you done along your journey either this year or previous years to kind of help you with investor relations and systems? Sure. Well, I, I think one of the biggest missing components to a lot of investor relations uh, components or, or kind of plans is the level of communication to investors. And it is investor relations and named that for a reason, because I believe you need to have that relationship with your investors. And so one of the things that we do is we make sure that all of our investors have access to be able to communicate with us at any point in time, whether it be our cell phone number, our, our you know, they, can, they can call us, they can text us, they can email us. And so a lot of it begins from the very beginning of the very first phone call. You know, and today's Tuesday, we're recording this on a Tuesday and Tuesday are my days to actually have you know, interviews like this, but also to do my investor inter my investor interviews. And so are my investor calls. When I get on a phone call with an investor, one of the things that I do when I get done is I make sure I send them a personal text message for me and I'll include my contact card that I have on my phone with them. And I'll just basically say, hey, thanks for jumping on a phone call with me today. It was a pleasure getting to know you. Here's my contact card. Then you can go ahead and that, that way you can go ahead and program all of my information into your phone. And that way in the future, if you have any questions, you can you have that direct access to me. Plus it gets me to make sure that they program me into their phone because in the future, what I'll also do is in the company field, I know they do this on the, on the iPhone. I'm sure on the Android devices, they do the same thing where you have a box where you can put in the company name. And in that box, I put the word investor and then I'll put the city and state of where they're located. And, and, I, and, and I get that information because I get their address for another level that we'll talk about in a minute for our investor relations piece, where we're actually sending them something on a monthly basis, but I get their city and state. And if they're located in an area that's, let's just say, for example, Riverview, Florida, do you guys know what Riverview, Florida is? I, I, I don't, except I do now, but I didn't at that time. And so if it's a city that I'm like, I don't really know where that is, I'll pull it up on the maps, on Google Maps, and I'll figure out what's the, the closest, largest MSA where I would potentially be flying into, right? And so I'd program, I put the name of that city, Riverview, Florida, and then I'll put in parentheses the name of that larger market, which is actually Tampa. So I'll put in Tampa. What that allows me to do is whenever I'm traveling to Tampa, I can now search in my phone, Tampa. And all my investors who are, who are located near Tampa, I can now text message them, call them, set up meetings with them, do an investor dinner, and again, have that relationship with them so that they know that I'm actually a person and that you know, I want them to be a, feel like we're, we, are, we have that relationship as well. And the more you can create that kind of connection and relationship with your investors, the more confident they're going to be to be able to invest with you. And so before I dive into this other piece that I was going to talk about, I want to talk first about my kind of philosophy as it comes to investor relations. And it kind of starts with what we call our investor triad. And the investor triad is a triangle, okay? So for those of you who are listening, if you want to get out a piece of paper, you can do this with me while we're, while we're doing this on the podcast. If you're driving, don't write it down. Um, but if you're, when you're sitting down, get out a piece of paper, and I want you to draw a triangle on your piece of paper. And at the top of that triangle, I want you to write the word no. And on the bottom left hand, I want you to write the word like. And on the bottom right-hand corner, I want you to write the word trust. Now, you might be thinking, I've heard of this before, no like and trust, yada, yada, I get it. Well, let me ask you this question. I want both Cody and Brian to answer this separately, okay? Um, so which one of those three do you think is the most important when it comes to this investor relations triad? Is it no, like, or trust? Cody? Trust. Brian? I'm going to go with trust, but if I you had to tell me it was a trick question, I'd say all three. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's, it's, it's not really a trick question, but it is, the, the answer to this will change your mindset when it comes to investor relations. The actual most important is actually the word no. And the reason why, because most people don't even say that, they'll either say like or trust or whatever. But the reason why no is the most important is because you have to first get people to know you before they actually have the opportunity to make an opinion as to whether or not they like or trust you. So the first thing in that whole entire step has got to be no. And that's where a lot of people get stuck because they try to do things to make them feel like they're, they're, they're more trustworthy or they're, they're more likable and whatever, but they're really, you, you should just be you and hopefully just you being you, you're likable and you're trustworthy, right? But when it comes to investor relations, you got to be able to get people to know you and you got to fill your funnel with people. But then the really cool thing about this investor triad, if you drew an arrow from no and you drew it down to like, and then you drew it down to trust, that's really kind of the process that happens. They get to know you and they start to read things about you, learn some stuff about you, maybe hear you on a podcast. They start to like you, right? Well, they don't really trust you yet. They're kind of starting that process. But the more they start to hear more about you, then they start to move over to this trust phase, right? And it's, it's usually after they have a conversation with you when they start to, you start to continue to build up that credibility and they trust you. And then when you have that next offering to put in front of them, they, you have now built that no like, and trust to a point where they can invest with you. They, won't, they, they don't mind wiring you 50, 100, a million dollars for that next project. Okay. Cause it, it does actually happen when it does this, this process does work. But the really cool thing is that once you perform for an investor, you can now draw an arrow from trust all the way back up to no, because that investor will now start to refer other friends and family to invest with you. And it will allow that entire cycle and process to happen again. And it's really cool when it starts to happen because now you're getting investors and you're not doing anything extra. And then and these people, they actually jump over from, they don't even go to like, they immediately go from no to trust because they immediately trust you because of the referral that they received from their friend and they trust their friend. And so that inherent trust from their friend comes in and now, now you've, now you've jumped a level and it just starts to continue to cycle through that. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's such an easy visual when you put it on paper like that, but it's, it's such a powerful uh, message to convey. And it's so important because you're right. And it's such a relationship business and, and um, no matter who you're talking to, if, if people, like you said, if people don't know them like you, it doesn't matter how much money they are, what your track record is, you, they're never going to work with you. So um, talk to us a little bit about though, you, you know, you've mentioned, you know, how you, how you spend time building that relationship piece of the business, right? Or, or the relationship, how people get to know you. Talk to us how we get them, how we nurture them then to get us to the, the like and trust uh, part of the triangle. Sure. So when they first come into your fold, right, you have to be able to have that initial phone call with them. That's one of the initial ways for them to get to the point of being able to build that credibility. Because hopefully by the time they've reached out to you, they kind of already like you. So they probably read something about you. They probably heard you on a podcast. Like those of you who are listening now, you might go, hey, I kind of like this guy, Dan. Let me jump over to his passiveinvesting.com website. And then you've already got to that point of liking me, right? And now you have, because you liked me enough to go to my website, fill out the investor form. Now we're having a phone call. And that phone call really sits between the like and the trust, right? Because you're trying to figure out, kind of feel me out, ask me questions. Is this guy legit? And usually within a matter of about 20 or 30 seconds, you're going you're gonna to be able to make that determination as to whether or not you actually trust this person or this particular group. And that's one of the reasons why even if you don't do the investor relations in your team and you have, say, maybe a, an, a, an employee or somebody else that's doing it, you have to make sure that they represent your company well, because that will be that make or break when it comes to whether or not they actually get to the point of trusting you. Now, that doesn't mean after a phone call, they're going to immediately just trust you, right? It's a process. It's kind of a, a dating phase, if you will. Now, some investors will immediately jump over and they'll invest, right? That's great. But there's got to be this kind of courting process. Some people choose to do that via email, and we do that as well. We have a monthly email that we'll send out to our investors, kind of updating them on the current, current, on the current portfolio, some articles that we've written lately, things like that. And then that's also where we'll include some of our investor dinners that we do across the country, where, where this year in 2020, we really haven't done any of them, except for maybe in January and February, but latter half, latter half or the latter part of the year, we haven't really done any of them. We're looking forward to in 2021 getting those started, but that's what we use that email for is to promote those, those actual investor dinners where I can try to have one-on-one -on -one contact with our investors. And then after every phone call, 
I actually will send them a copy of our newsletter. It's a really nice kind of high glossy printed newsletter where each one of our managing partners, which we have three of them, um, each one of the managing partners will write an article inside that newsletter about something that they're working on. So that way the investor can continue to kind of know how we think, how we operate, and they're going to continue to you know, kind of build that level of, 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 of trust, right? And the reason why I say it's kind of a courting process or a dating process is because I have people that have been receiving my newsletter for like a year and they finally invest in a deal and they, and they when they invest in that deal you know they'll reach out and they're like yeah i've been following you for a while i know we had our phone call but you and you've had your emails but this newsletter is phenomenal and i love learning from it and i just now felt comfortable enough to be able to invest right so everybody's gonna be a little bit different on that scale that now that spectrum of when they're ready to invest and i want to make sure that i'm also getting their email, which may or may not go to spam. And the reason why I say that is because one of the main reasons why we created the newsletter, the physical newsletter is because we have a pretty high open rate with our emails. It's about 53% open rate with our emails with our investors. It's pretty high. And anybody in email marketing would say anything over about 15% is like phenomenal. And we, ours is 53%, but this is a very highly curated and, and, and very highly uh, uh, opted in, if you will, list of investors that are wanting this information. But I still look at that and go, there's 47% that are not receiving it. And it's that 47% is the reason that really caused us to want to do this newsletter. And it is a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun at the same time. And we also get to like present things to our investors that we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be able to do. And then at the same time of that newsletter, whenever we have our next project, our next deal, we actually print out the investor offering memorandum and we print it out full glossy. I usually have a couple copies here, but I had an, an investor uh, lunch the other day with an investor, a couple of investors here locally in Columbia and I gave it to them. So I don't have them here with me, but it's a really nice full gloss, like, like perfect bound uh, brochure, not only brochure, but booklet that uh, is of the entire offering. And they're usually, you know, 50 to 75 pages. And we physically mail that to every single one of our investors that we have a mailing list on. We actually have their address on and we do it via priority mail. So it does cost us the money, usually about $20 an investor, but the offering itself is the one that actually pays for all the marketing. So the, but we were able to go to get that offering into the hands of our investors and allow them to be able to review it. And a lot of times they'll take that and they'll send it off to their, they'll, they'll give it off to one of their friends or family members, or, Hey, look what I invested in, put it on their coffee table, and that kind of stuff. But then we do some things that are strategic as well, where a couple of months ago, when we were sending out our, our, our newsletter to our investors, we actually included an extra newsletter and we shrunk, we, we shrunk wrap it and then put a sticker on the outside and said, we're giving you an extra copy of the newsletter this month so you can pass it off to a family or friend, friend or colleague that may be interested in investing. Because guess what? People usually hang out with other people that are like them. And so that, that also helps kind of you know, spur, spur on some additional you know, referrals and leads and things like that. But you, any, anytime you can do that kind of stuff, it continues to build that relationship and build that, that credibility to the point where they actually want to invest with you. Yeah. You know, that, that's such a, it's such a unique touch point, right? Because I think, right, like you said, you know, everything is so digital now that it almost takes the personal touch out of it. So having a mailed copy like that, uh, it, it just adds that personal touch, right? You take the time, you took the investment uh, to send this beautiful book it out. And not only that, I love, I've heard you mention this before. You also keep it very family focused as well, right? You have, a, I believe, a coloring book in there as well and we things do. like that to get, the, to get the kids engaged as well. So make it a family conversation when the investors see this booklet. The moment you can penetrate the family unit is the moment you've, you have really built credibility. Because if one of your investors takes that coloring piece and actually gives it to their, their, their child and they color it, and of course, they'll color it. It has passiveinvesting.com on it and they put it up on their refrigerator. Guess what? Now it's an advertisement that we didn't even pay for. And they are now having their family and friends come over for dinner and holidays and family. And that's up on the, on the refrigerator. And it's a conversation piece now too, right? Um, and then we, of course, we also include on the back of every one of our issues, we'll include a word search which is actually those words are curated from the prior month's newsletter. And so we'll take words from the prior month, and actually include it in that word search. We're doing something totally different for 2021, but um, I'll keep that a secret for now. <laughs> I love that, man. I appreciate you sharing that. I think you, uh, you just spilled the beans, man. You're sharing all the, the, the big secrets here. And, and um, you know, one thing I want to kind of go back and highlight is, you know, as you mentioned, especially when it comes to these mailed copies and whatnot, it, it can get kind of costly and not everybody may be in that position yet. Uh, in their business to be able to afford that. But I think it's important to understand that you cannot 
devalue the importance of keeping that personal touch with your investors. Right. And when you're talking about, you know, like you said, maybe a $20 investment to send a priority mail out to an investor that's maybe investing a hundred thousand, a million dollars, that is a pennies on the value of the dollar that, you know, that partner brings for you. So I think it's important as you continue to scale your business and as you continue to build out this, this investor nurturing, you know, don't put a price tag on it, you know, if that makes sense. Right. No, I, I think that's, that's a very crucial. And there's two different levels here, right? Because we have the, the newsletters, right? And we didn't do the newsletters in the very beginning. I wish I would have done them in the beginning. And even if I didn't have the funds in the beginning, I would do something on some level, whether it be a one sheet typed up Word document or two sheets or whatever. Now you, you can easily do some nice design inside of Word or, or Publisher or whatever, print that off, cost you like a buck 50 to send that out, right? Maybe not even that. I think right now our newsletters are costing us right around like that $2, $2.50 mark to be able to send it out. And that's full gloss, 12 pages, you know, put it there. They, they pack it and stuff it for us. We give them the mailing list. They do everything for us, right? They print the envelope. You could easily do something where if you had only a hundred investors, where you printed it out yourself. And I mean, I'm the type of person where that's what I would have done in the very beginning. If I didn't have the money is I'm going to print them out. I'm going to lick all the envelopes. I'm going to handwrite everything. If I had to, I'm going to find a way to make sure I can do this because I'm telling you it's something that has really been very beneficial for us. And if you don't, even if you don't print off the investor offering memorandums right now, still try to do that newsletter because that newsletter will be very, very important to stay in contact with your investors. Yeah. Love that. Love that. And again, it goes back to the point too, as you, you've kind of explained your, your investor nurturing process, there's so many touch points that you have. It's not just the initial phone call and okay, we'll see you when we have a deal. It's, you know, Hey, it's a phone call. It's in-person dinner. It's the, it's the monthly email. It's the newsletter that they get in the mail. Like you have all these multiple touch points and that kind of helps to really strengthen that, that relationship. Like you said, they get to know you, even though you're not talking to them every day on the phone, they're still getting to understand who you are, your investing thesis and and your business. Right. Absolutely. So, So, Awesome, man, man, just, just great, great information. Oh man, I would, I would love to spend all day kind of talking about this again, big, big fan of this framework and, and, and Brian and I, you know, our partner, John, we talk about this all the time about adopting a lot of these very principles that you've, you've kind of talked to because we see how powerful that is. So really appreciate you spending uh, that time and, and um, spilling those, those uh, valuable knowledge. I do it. <laughs> appreciate that. So, you know, unfortunately we're kind of getting into the end of our time here, but wanted to give you an opportunity. You got a couple of big conferences coming up. Wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to those and tell us what we can expect going into Q1 of 2021. Uh, well, I, I don't know the exact dates for the, the Hunter Thompson one, but I am speaking at the Hunter Thompson event, which is the 5 million in 30 days event. It's coming up here in January. You can Google, I think, 5 million in 30 days, Hunter Thompson, you'll find out that information. Uh, but you can also go to the conference that we put on, which is actually called the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit. You can just go to mfinsummit.com to find more information about that event coming up. That's going to be January 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. And unlike a lot of events right now where they used to be live and in person and then now converting to virtual, this event has always been virtual. So this is actually our fifth time doing this virtual event. We're doing a lot of unique and cool things right now. We have over 50, we have a lot of uh, over 50 speakers that come to this event every year or every twice a year, right? I, we actually do this in January and June every year. And, uh, and it's really a neat time to be able to see everybody in multifamily coming together and really providing a lot of value to new people, but also even, you know, veteran people in the space to really learn about multifamily investing. And we don't do any like hard sales pitching or anything like that. It's really an educational event and it's not very costly either. So uh, you can go over there find out more information about it. And I would love to have you join us there in January. Yeah. Great conferences, by the way, absolutely. You know, been a part of those in the past and and highly recommend them to anybody. So uh, if you have an opportunity, we can definitely vouch for that, man. Definitely make sure to make the time to go. You'll, you'll, you won't be disappointed uh, by any means. So, well, Dan, before we go, I've got a few more questions for you, man, and then we'll wrap up. We're going to call it the final four here, but um, you know, we'd love to pick your brain a little bit more and uh, really like to know uh, what do you like to do for your continued education to further your investing? 
Well, I, I liked my podcast. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm, my, my continuing education, a lot of it is spurred from the podcast. I get a lot of ideas by interviewing really cool in, uh, investors. Because uh, like you mentioned earlier in the show, our podcast, we only interview active real estate investors that are closing real multifamily deals and they can't come on the podcast unless they've closed that in the last 12 months. So I get a lot of, you know, you know, mentor, not mentors, but a lot of uh, coaches and a lot of people that, you know, want to be on or like people that are, you know, gurus in this space, but they're right now, they're not closing any deals. So I tell them like, well, you can come on, but you have to close a deal in the last 12 months. So I learned a lot from that because I get to pick everybody's brain and pick everybody's deal apart to figure out how they actually closed the deal and how they structured it and things like that. Um, but I'm also an avid reader. So I do like to read, read quite a bit and, uh, and read, you know, uh, probably more than anybody uh, that I know of um, on a daily basis. That's awesome, man. Uh, Brian, we got, we have a target. We got to get our first deal done to get on Dan's show. Okay. <laughs> hey, we're going to make it happen. <laughs> love to have you on. Just more motivation, man. I love it. So, uh, well, tell us what have been some of the lasting lessons that you've learned along your journey? Well, uh, one of the, one of the first things is you have to always, find investors, right? And then the second thing is you got to always find deals. So this, this apartment syndication business doesn't work unless you have both of those things and you can't drop the ball on either one of them. You have to always be finding the next deal and you have to always be finding the next investor. And so you can't stop on either one of those things. And if I would have done something different in the very beginning, I would have found a lot more investors in the very beginning, right? Not that I didn't try to, but I would try to, try, I would try to do more to try to find more investors um, as I was getting started. And so as you guys are getting started and other people that are listening are getting started to, to be able to raise more capital, that's what you got to do is you got to find more investors because it'll give you more confidence to be able to compete with deals. Because right now we're competing on these large 20 to $75 million properties. We're putting up a lot of, a lot of hard money, like significant amounts into the seven figures that is like basically non-refundable day one. And the only way you can do that is being able to have a really good solid investor base behind you. And right now we're able to go to our sellers that are that we're buying deals from. And they, one of the number one questions they ask is where is your equity coming from? And we're able to confidently tell them, yes, we, our equity comes from syndication. And they always kind of get this cringe when they hear that because they're like, they don't have the money, right? <laughs> um, but then we tell them like we've raised everything from contract to close and we have never not been able to close a deal. We've always closed a deal and then we've never had to extend because of equity. There's been a few little small things from due diligence and things like that. But when it comes to the equity, we always are confident we can bring that in, which allows us to be able to compete on more deals. Yeah. Well, you know, as you alluded to in, in uh, the big portion of the show here is in our conversation is that, you know, the investor relations and that relationship building is so important and it takes time, number one. And, and I, I encourage everybody in this space that this adage of find a good deal and the money will come. I, I just don't believe it to be true in this space. You know, I've because seen too many deals fall through that way and people lose a lot of money. I've learned the hard way myself in that experience. And so, you know, you, you have to really build those relationships and focus on that first and before you go out there and trying to, you know, fight off more than you can chew. So I appreciate you sharing that, but uh, yep. um, tell the listeners any advice that you'd give them to help them further their businesses. Well, the first thing that I decided to do in the very beginning that uh, allowed me to have a kind of hockey stick growth in my business, you know, earlier on with the clinics is I had to learn to delegate because I'm an entrepreneur at heart and I'm the type of person where I feel like I can do everything better than everybody else. And it's a flaw that I have. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs suffer with that, but until we can get out of our own way and actually hire people that are really good at doing things that we don't need to be doing is when we can really start to focus on the things that we really need to be focused on, which is the growth and the vision of the actual business itself. So being able to learn to delegate sooner rather than later. Yeah. Great advice, man. Really appreciate that. All right, Dan, tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and passiveinvesting.com and even get connected with you. Sure. So you can obviously go to our website, passiveinvesting.com. Um, if you want to join us on one of our future properties or just follow us, we do have a lot of active syndicators that invest with us as well. Because of course, when you have a self-directed IRA or 401k, you can't invest in your own deals. And so we do have a lot of those types of investors and syndicators that are active out there that invest with us. So if you're in that situation, or even if you're just looking at passively investing and you're a passive investor and not even looking into the active side of things, love to have you join us on our platform 
platform and we'll have a one-on-one -on -one phone call with you to discuss your investment goals to make sure you are the right fit for us. And you can do that by filling out that Passive Investor Club form on our website. And then of course, everybody else can also find me on multifamilyinvestornation.com and also on LinkedIn. So you have a good presence on there, post a lot of articles, a lot of good content on there as well. So uh, again, thank you guys both. Cody and Brian for having me on and uh, looking forward to following you guys some more. Dan, it's been thank an you, honor, Dan. man. Really appreciate you having me on the show and thanks for tuning in with us. All right. Thank you. Awesome.